Hello, this is John Evans, and welcome back to a new episode of Book and Spade. In the early morning hours before the rising of the sun, a light shone in Jerusalem. The light emerged not from a great mountain top, not from a great lecture hall, not erupting as a result of a fiery cataclysm, but in the womb of the earth, in the tomb of a rich man, containing the body of God incarnate. God himself arose, triumphant after having been mocked, after having been tortured, after having been rejected by his people, after having descended into the netherworld to lead up from there the souls that had waited century upon century for his arrival. He arose, having crushed death permanently under his feet, And yet, who was waiting for him when he emerged from the empty tomb? On the evening of Good Friday, after the great earthquake, the renting of the rocks, the parting of the veil, most of the disciples had fled. Only John and the holy women remained. John would have brought the news back. And the crowd would have been in constant fear who had traveled with Jesus. If the high priest could assassinate our master who was able to walk on water, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, what more could they do to us? And so the upper room in Jerusalem must have been indeed a very dreaded place, filled with whispers, peering always over the next corner in the busy city streets, wondering if at any moment there would be a rounding up of the twelve, or at least of the eleven, after Judas hung himself, and of the seventy who had followed them so far from Galilee. But it was on the morning of the resurrection that the creator of the universe, having taken on human flesh to die for our sins, now raised gloriously, entered into the upper room, astonishing his disciples. We are told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, that they did not believe their very eyes, until Jesus sat down and ate with them a honeycomb, some bread and some fish. We are told that they were afraid. Perhaps they thought that vengeance would come on them for having fled, for having departed when they swore to stand. Yet Jesus comes with forgiveness And more than forgiveness, he comes with a commission, a great commission of peace. His words ring down to us. His voice speaks to our hearts and beckons us into the oasis of his healing, caught between pierced palms. We read in John chapter 20. Peace be with you. My peace I give you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. 
Peace be with you. My peace I give to you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. The gift of the Holy Spirit, of course, would fully come upon the disciples at Pentecost much later, at Shavuot. But you see here the first inklings of the gift. You see here that Christ now declares to the disciples, because he has cast Satan under his heels, we now have the opportunity to walk in the Spirit. And putting aside, of course, the disputes between Catholics and Protestants over the interpretation of the meaning of those verses, there is one point on which all commentators can agree, that Easter means the war is won. Easter means we have come into peace. That the debt which had cut us off, which had separated us from the presence of the Father, has been paid on the tree for us. And therefore, we can say with Isaiah in his 53rd chapter, by his stripes we are healed. But who is waiting for him that Easter Sunday? If even John was astonished at his coming, who had traveled throughout so many miles and roads, if even Mary Magdalene was astonished having come to the empty tomb, crying with astonishment, mistaking Jesus for the gardener, Rabboni, and clinging to his feet. This is what prompts remember Jesus to say, in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, to my God and your God. So if all these were astonished, who was expectantly waiting? Who knew? We are told in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, how at the arrival of the shepherds, Mary pondered all these things in her heart. We are told when she brought the holy child to Simeon and Anne, the prophetess, that Simeon prophesied that a sword would pierce her heart also, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Some translations will say a sword will pierce your soul also. In either case, there is a sense in which Mary walks away from the scene and also ponders this prophecy of future suffering in her heart. Jesus had said repeatedly, leading up to his arrival in Jerusalem, that the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, even as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish that the Son of Man would be betrayed and handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked and crucified, and that on the third day he would rise. Which of us earthly sons, if we were going on a long journey, a journey that would be perilous, dangerous, and potentially costly to ourselves, which of us wouldn't warn or pre-announce this to our mothers. And if we had returned from a long journey, the least we could do would be to text our mothers that we had come back, that we were safe and that we were whole. And the most we could do before visiting strangers and acquaintances and distant friends and relations would be to come home first, to embrace her, her and to tell her of our undying love and gratitude and affection. Therefore, to quote Jesus himself concerning the gifts God gives, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
For if your child asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? And he, if he asks for a loaf of bread, will you give him a stone? And if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Truly, Jesus, the divine, eternal Son of God, knows how to give good gifts, even greater gifts, to his children spiritually. And therefore, as the ideal son would have given extraordinary gifts, remarkable gifts upon his mother, gifts of kindness, gifts of attention, gifts of prayer, gifts of gratitude and of love. United with her in regards to his human flesh and united in the bond of his love. And therefore, it is my own humble belief and the opinion of many of the earliest Christians that Jesus told his mother where he was going. And therefore, when she held his bruised and battered and lacerated body beyond all human likeness at the foot of the cross, that she knew, she knew that he would rise from the dead. And therefore, Scripture had no need to record that reunion. For Jesus was always united with her. Jesus was always united to Mary's heart. And regardless of 500 years of schismatic debate, the great mind of a C.S. Lewis could confess that we see in the passion of the Christ not only our own ransom and our freedom, but not so much God on trial, but we fallen humanity put to the test. And so it is as we celebrate Easter, now having seen how far humanity has fallen, the extent to our cruelty, the extent to our injustice, the extent to which we have negated our capacity to love, torturing the truth, causing the truth to bleed and to die. That on this glorious third day, we see the triumph of a humanity restored to its proper place in harmony with the will of God the Garden of Eden, restored. As humanity is invited by Jesus Christ, now through the victory and seal of approval that is the resurrection, to be co-heirs with him to eternal life. As we know in the familiar scene with Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, when she sees Jesus, She mistakes him in the garden, for the tomb is in a garden, just as the fall occurred in a garden. And she mistakes him for a gardener. Her mistake is actually spiritually valid. He is indeed our gardener. And knowing that we had exiled ourselves by the fall, He is now come, arrayed in majesty, with arms wide open as the living icon of the Father, we see in the parable of the prodigal son, with arms wide open to receive us with forgiveness, having crushed the lies 
of Satan under his heel. And so Mary's words in Luke chapter 1, at the event in which she said yes to being the mother of God, become for us the model by which we can best say yes ourselves to God's Easter invitation. Behold, I am the handmaid or hand servant of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. And later on, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has done good to me, and mighty is his name. We should rejoice with the rejoicing of the apostles as they heard Jesus many days from that point on. I believe 50 days later. The words to go forth and filled with the Spirit to proclaim the truth. We should be filled with gratitude and an increase to reach out to one another with the kindness with which we have been shown and to recognize that although we await, of course, Christ's second coming in which he will indeed call the nations to judgment, the victory cry has already gone forth from the empty tomb. You can go to the Holy Land and visit the tombs of King David and visit the tombs of the patriarchs and their bones still lie in dust. But the tomb of Jesus is empty. And this signifies for us that he is very much with us and remains in the tabernacle, the tent of our hearts always. And that we too, at the ending of time, as we read in Daniel chapter 7, in the book of Revelation, chapters 19 through 22, and in the writings of Ezekiel, the dry bones vision, I believe in Ezekiel chapter 37, that we too will bodily rise. And so it is, we have hope. I hope to continue to celebrate with you soon. May God bless us all.